second presentation story is the uh, Professor Droid, uh, latest dog. Uh, he's working as a professor in the Amsterdam School of Communication Research, University of Amsterdam. And he wrote, uh, he's an author of a big famous book, uh, uh, Knowledge Based Economy in the Sociology Theory Communication and the Development and Measurement and the Self Organization of Scientific Communication, which is a very uh, popular book in the social science field. Let's welcome the Professor Lloyd Lester. statistics, but that we also can say something from the data, that we can learn something from the data. And, and it's easier for me to stand here. Uh, <laughs> and, and then I want, there's kind of difference between Henry Jetskowicz and me. Uh, Henry Jetskowicz I collaborated with to organize the Triple Helix conferences and the Triple Helix. He is more institutionally oriented. And of course, if you talk about university industry government relations, in the society are economic exchange relations, markets, political interventions, scientific communications. So I make that distinction between a new institutional model, I call it a new institutional model because it's about a network of relations, it's not about the institutions itself, it's about the network of relations and therefore we call it a new institutional model. 
And of course, then we talk about the function of knowledge in the economy, but we assume that the economy is political economy. Yeah. And so the, the knowledge comes additional to the political economy as an exogenous factor, as they say in economics. So it comes from the outside. Yeah. It is a kind of residue in economic reasoning, and it becomes very difficult in neoclassical economics to think about innovation. You need to go to evolutionary economics. And therefore, I'm talking about, that's why I come from, I, uh, that's from a new evolutionary model, and it relates to the discussion which we had yesterday, then it becomes more difficult to to, to talk about what you're talking about, yeah? Because you have to specify that theoretically, and then the measurement becomes relational, becomes the observations in relation to the, observ uh, to the expectations. I'm not saying that you cannot do that. Very interesting. This is very interesting work can be done here. But my interest is particularly here. And my claim is that you then endogenize the knowledge dimension at the third dimension, in addition to political, in the two dimensions of political economy, the economic exchange relations and the political side of the political economy, you additionally get this third dimension and that is a specific type of, in relation to the discussion of yesterday, of the code of communication is different in science than it is from the economy and from political decision making. That's my point, so that we here have three main, I'm not saying that these are the three only communication systems in society. Of course, there are other communication systems like religion, like even personal life, love is an important communication system, affection, affection, how you feel, uh, we have feelings to each other, that's also very important. But there are all kinds of communication systems, perhaps, as I said yesterday, there's an alphabet of them, and therefore we have a complex system, but these are the three which we are interested, interested in when we want to talk about political economy in relation to a knowledge-based economy. Yeah? So how do the functional fluxes of communication that, and two networks relate to each other? And that relates to my work on scientometrics, because also there I had fluxes of communication. Scientific communication is continuously in flux. Yeah? So you have fluxes of communication going through systems. So you need a, a measurement. You, you cannot do it statically. You need something about what is changing in the system. And that brought me to entropy statistics because that allows you... Uh, entropy statistics is, is not a statistics, it is a calculus. Yeah? And I, I'm not sure that everybody... Yeah, you had it in high school. This calculus is the dx dt. Yeah? So there is a T involved, and yesterday also we talked extensively about the T, the T for time, there's a, there's a flux going on, yeah? So we can do, we can try to see the footprint or the fingerprint of the flux at a certain moment in the data. And then the question becomes, can we also see in the data that there is a reduction of uncertainty, and that's what brings me to this triple helix indicator. Because that allows precisely to do that. And that has been a lot of discussion. So, okay, this is a picture to show you why it is so important to talk about the new evolutionary model. What, what I show here is from the American Association of University Tech Technology Managers. They yearly report, they have a yearly report where they report on all kinds of parameters about, and then they start talking about how, how great the system is because it is growing all the time. So if you plot their the figures, here you have, for example, the number of, of personnel, full-time equivalents, uh, which they use in their, in, their, in their offices. So you see the last 10 years, and it is growing all the time. And here you also have the new patent applications. They are also boosting about that. So all everything is growing, so the money is well spent. If you look at the number of US patent issues yeah, at the university, it's not growing. So what's happening is that you pour more money into the system. Yeah? You get more activity, you get more people involved, 
but the net result is not that it leads to growth in the essential outcome which you want to get out of it. So in order to understand how a system works, you need to think not only about how many people, how many things are happening, uh, not only the consequence, you need a kind of theoretical framework to say what is really interesting, what, what, should, what is the type of outcome I, I want to see from that, and can I find that? And, and I'm now going to try to explain you the new evolutionary model of the triple helix, yeah? It's not discarding the other one, yeah? The other one is also legitimate. You can do network analysis, it's very interesting. But as Hans said, I'm now not concentrating on the yes, and I'm not concentrating on the no, yeah? And <coughs> I'm going to uh, try to explain why, for example, patents, but you can do it for anything, you can also do it for universities. Patents are a very easy example because patents have a relevance for both universities and industry. They have an economic relevance. Yeah? So they're economically important. But here they are an input parameter. They are input to the economy. And here they are an output parameter in the knowledge system. Yeah? We produce patents. Most of us don't, but yeah. <laughs> Some of us do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and here we have a state office. The state is involved to give, because the function of a patent is to give legal protection. So you have three dynamics working. You have the knowledge dynamics in the generation of the patent. You have the economic dynamics of why we do it anyhow, yeah, because we want to earn money from it. And, and you have the legal system which is involved also. So you get that patents and anything can be placed in such a framework, in such a multidimensional framework. Yeah. Yesterday I placed people and text. I used people, text, and cognitions, but this, the idea is the same that you have a multidimensional framework. You have different co communications interface. So some patents are more knowledge-based than others. Some patents are more uh, economic of economic value than others and the type of disciplines which uh, who are studying patents in terms of uh, their knowledge base is a very sometimes a different one from the people who are more interested in the firm in the theory of the firm and so you get also different disciplines uh, across that so you have seen a similar picture yesterday but then the subject of study was science itself and knowledge and now the subject of study is the simple helix where you are now at the level of society. Okay, so here you see the patents in, and, and in order to make it, it's, it's like yesterday, but then we were talking about something else. It's the same model, so you have wealth generation in relation to political system which is in place, which, leads, which has to do with the political economy. Here you have wealth generation in, in relation to novelty production, that's why the science system steps in, and you get innovation. And here you get that the novelty production has to be organized in research laboratories and universities, and that also needs legislative control. And you get the national, the, the politi political system, which also comes into play a role. And now the question becomes the next picture. So these are the proxies. Yeah, we use industry as a proxy for the economic activity university as a proxy for uh, the knowledge activity and government as a proxy. So I'm not putting them between quotation marks because they are just my proxies. And then I can say how are patents circulating in that system? Is it only industry making its own patents? Yeah. Uh, is it only, uh, what does government do in relation to that circulation and how is the university also playing, playing a part in that. So, and actually what I'm interested in is we have here the knowledge flow, we have here the market flow, we have here economic, uh, uh, political decision making, but how does that lead to a kind of circulation of patents from the one system into the other system? And how efficient is that uh, circle, which you could call in relation to yesterday, a hypercycle?